Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible study. Today we are in chapter 8 of the scroll of Romans, the epistle or the letter addressed to the people of Rome. But instead of the whole chapter, as you're accustomed to, I'm breaking this one down. Sometimes I do that. You'll see that throughout the Ephesus School Network. Sometimes we go slower. We chew on smaller chunks of his word of life so that we can digest it a little better. And since we will be listening and hearing again and again throughout our lives, think of these just as introductions, as not conclusions, the Alpha alone and not the Alpha and the Omega. Very key distinction. So as always, you can subscribe wherever you are hearing this, hopefully with ears that hear. And if you leave comments, like, and or rate us, more people will find us. So if you feel that you want to contribute, but you're not wanting to contribute monetarily, that's a very easy non-monetary way and the little things add up. That's kind of one of the strong forces of democracy, although as we speak about, that is not a scriptural ideal. It can be used because scripture is functional. Our living God is functional. And so he can turn that which is perceived as bad into the good. Because why not? You can also share the link to wherever you found this with your friends, neighbors, enemies, and strangers. And you can share the very words of God that you hear me recite and read aloud. Finally, if you are the monetarily contributing type, you can head over to patreon.com slash aksum. That's a new link, but same old place. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash aksum, A-K-S-U-M. Without further ado, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. We'll begin with verses 1 to 8, and we are in the King James Version, so friendly to the public domain. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The law, the nomos here in the Greek, of course, is in reference to the Hebrew Torah, which is the teaching or the instruction as you are instructed throughout the Ephesus School Network. God did what you could not do, what man could not do, especially man exposed by the Torah, by the instruction, by the teaching, by the mirror which God placed in front of man to show man's inadequacy, incompetency, impotence and God's omnipotence 
Hulum Chayinat, the ability to do all, his all powerfulness. So stop being a meat bag. Stop living according to the flesh. Live instead according to the spirit. In July 2021, as I'm recording this, there are a lot of verses battles, battles between R&B artists, hip hop artists, and millions of people watch on social media, primarily Instagram, Twitter, perhaps even YouTube. And they watch people see how two artists compete by playing their greatest hits and letting the audience again democratically decide who won. Well, again, here there's no democracy, but there are two lords. The one lord is the flesh, and the other lord is the spirit, and they are in a versus battle. I will ask you who you think won, but I don't care what your ultimate answer is because I know what the answer is. And if you want to see what Saint Dioscoros' answer is, I invite you to read and hear the anaphora or the liturgy of Saint Dioscorus or Dioscoros and focus especially on the ending or the benedictory prayers, the benediction, the final prayers that the priest says before the carrier of the flesh and the blood returns into the Holy of Holies or the inner sanctuary. I think it could be summated like this. And I see this come up in a number of ways. And I'll give you a few examples and we'll move on to the other verses. These are two questions that two different people could ask. The meat bag appreciator or the one living according to the flesh asks, how much can I get away with and still be a Christian or still get into heaven? And the one living according to the spirit asks, how much can I please God? And I think the greater question is, of course, how much can I please God? I'm biased as uh, my namesake is Enoch and to be Enochic, as I've sell, said elsewhere, and for those who are familiar with Genesis or Barashit will know this, to be Enochic is to want to please God. Enoch does not mean please God, but in the story, Enoch is the one who pleases God and thus is hidden from amongst people trying to find him. Some people ask about the length of the liturgical service or the length of a biblical reading. They complain and they whine about it. Others may do so about feeding the needy or clothing the homeless or the naked. Whatever it may be, plug in your own example. Are you asking how much can you get away with or are you asking, how much can you increase the pleasure of God? Not because he needs your increase, but because doing so would be your way of finding joy in his will. Verses 9 to 11. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ... He is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. A lot of if-then statements there. The main thing to focus on is God or the one who raised Jesus from the dead. He that raised up Christ from the dead. Note the repetition. We're talking about the same person. So is that power the power of the one who raised up Jesus, the power of the one who raised up Christ from the dead in you. If so, then living according to the flesh should be dead and living according to the spirit should be alive and well.
like the good is language. In fact, better than that. Verses 12 to 17. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We'll end here for the day. A few more thoughts on the verses I just read aloud. The spirit of adoption. Father Paul Nadim Tarazi tells us about the Roman context of which we have the Anglo-Saxon word genuine. Genuine or genuine is a declaration that a Roman patrician makes to the son whom he has adopted. The biological material, the biological facts of that son are irrelevant to the Roman patrician. What matters is the will of the Roman patrician. In our case, the Roman patrician is God. In the history of Ethiopia, the Oromo of Ethiopia have a policy, Gudifacha, in Afan Oromo, the language of the Oromo, and it is also incorporated into Amharic. I, to the best of my ability, I know Amharic pretty well. There's no organic Amharic word for adoption. They adopted it, which is funny itself, from the Oromo, and the Guddifacha policy, similar to the Roman policy, did not care about the biological material, the biological facts, the lineage of the person or the tribe. But they were willing to adopt anyone who would enter into their culture. I've heard the same thing of various Native American or American Indian tribes, although I don't know them by name enough to draw that example, I remember Elizabeth Warren biting into the trap, falling into the trap of President Donald Trump, went and got a test, and she found that she was less American Indian than Joe Rogan is African descent, and he's only 1%. She was like 1% of 1% biologically American Indian, which is well, well within the margin of error. And I recall the tribe that she was trying to say she was associated with said this is offensive. It is a particularly narrow Anglo-Saxon tradition to say that the blood is necessary for adoption. It's not even the full Western tradition because we're mentioning the Roman tradition right now. It's like a very narrow part of the Western tradition that has this obsession. And so they said, if we wanted to adopt you, we would adopt you. But we haven't. And so you would be adopted wholeheartedly, 100%. No compromise of 50% or 30% or 12.5% or whatever. And again, the Oromo of Ethiopia were after the 16th century, after the migrations, expansions, invasion, whatever you want to call it, extended the hand of inclusion by the Ethiopian Empire and themselves adopted writ large and so again in that case maybe you know being general kushites they're close to the stock of ethiopia you could say that but i think the spirit of adoption was there the spirit that would have you like in galatians and in romans here call out abba pater abba father in aramaic and in greek Father, Papa, Daddy. 
Ababa, the Jew and the Gentile, the Jew and the Greek, all of the high culture folks, but of course all of the low culture folks too, like the Scythian, and even those dark Cushites, those Ethiopians, are included if they place their trust in Jesus. They become an heir of Jesus. And to become an heir of Jesus is not all roses and giggles. It's not alga ba alga. It's not bed or mattress upon mattress. It's not chark ba chark. It's not rag upon rag. It's not all easy pickings. If you want to be an heir of Jesus, you will suffer with Jesus, contrary to what those, in fact, not just contrary, diametrically opposed to what the preachers and teachers of the prosperity gospel will tell you. That's no gospel of ours. The great Catholic priest, Father Berrigan, whom I quote often, known for dismantling nuclear arsenals, says it simply, if you want to follow Jesus, you better look good on wood. If you want to follow Jesus, you better look good on wood. If you want to be glorified with Jesus, you will suffer with Jesus. Glory to God.